Hello, and welcome to the 111th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday, the 15th of February, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, I am delighted to welcome Daniel Finn to the show to talk about his really excellent new book, One Man's Terrorist, A Political History of the IRA. Daniel is currently a writer for Jacobin and has also previously worked for the New Left Review. The massive surge of Sinn Féin in the recent Irish general election to become the most popular political party is the culmination of a long-term strategy which led the party from a point of political irrelevance in the South to the brink of government. This clear example of long-term strategic planning fits neatly into our recent reading group series on the necessary strategic reorientation needed by the revolutionary left. This is the first of a two-parter, the second of which will be released as a patron-only episode. Speaking of which, I have the new patron Duncan to thank. If you'd like to help support the show, why not join the Patreon gang gang? For only $5 a month, or under $1 an episode, you get two Patreon-only episodes every month, and a right to vote on the next reading group series. If you don't have any spare though, why not just spread the good commie word and give me a lovely review over on iTunes. Okay, to the interview. Daniel, you opened the book with a description of the, you know, the kind of overall context of the war and what it meant to the people in Northern Ireland and what damage was caused and everything. Do you want to put the conflict into some kind of overall context for people who aren't so aware of what went on? Yeah, one of the points that I made at the beginning of the book was that there had been a tendency to downplay the impact of the conflict in in the north of Ireland because it didn't fit the stereotype of what a war should be and particularly for the British military it didn't fit their preferred stereotype of the kind of war they wanted to be fighting which would involve conventional warfare artillery tanks large-scale infantry formations confronting each other on the battlefield while they were actually fighting the war in the 1970s and the 1980s in in the north of Ireland they found it to be a bit of an embarrassment, not so much from a moral point of view, because they thought they were the good guys, but from a professional point of view, it wasn't the kind of conflict they wanted to be involved in where you were facing a shadowy enemy that didn't wear a military uniform, that carried out hit and run attacks, shootings, sniping, bombings, and so on, that was armed with light weapons and, and with car bombs and homemade explosives. Uh, that wasn't the kind of war that they like to think of themselves as fighting. But if you look at it in a more realistic perspective, um, not the self-image of the British Army, but its actual practice since 1945, that's been much more common as the the kind of warfare they've been involved in from the decolonization wars in the the 1950s and 1960s. And now since 9-11, the the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the typical enemy for the British Army has been an irregular guerrilla force that was armed with light weapons and and a sort of ramshackle military capacity. So against that background, it's possible, I think, to see uh, what was happening in the north of Ireland in a more realistic light. It was a really devastating conflict because the casualty figures of approximately three and a half thousand people dead, it may not seem very high when you compare it in absolute terms with wars that were happening at roughly the same time in Lebanon or, or Bosnia or the Congo. But when you adjust it for population, it was a very high damaging and, and, and had, a, had a very uh, drastic impact on, on the people of the region because those casualty figures were very much in line with, for example, the, the British casualty figures, both civilian and military during the Second World War or with the American casualties on both sides during the Civil War, both Union and Confederacy. So it did really have a a devastating impact on people's lives. And the fact that there were no sieges, there was no artillery bombardment, there was no, to a large extent, there was no aerial warfare at all, didn't change the fact that it had such a huge impact on on people's lives. Yeah, there's one stat you have in there that there was 48,000 people injured. Like, that's a hell of a a a figure. That's like five... What was the population of Northern Ireland at the time? Was it one million or one and a half? Approximately one million, yeah. So it's like nearly 5% of the population 
with yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's an actual it's, physical it's, injury. When when you break it down, the number of people in Northern Ireland who were totally unaffected by by the conflict, uh, whether directly or through someone that they knew, a relative or a neighbour or a friend, being killed or injured, would be quite small. Now there was regional variation in that, where there were particular regions such as the so-called Gold Coast of North Down that were barely affected by the conflict at all. And then there were areas like South Armagh, West and North Belfast that were disproportionately affected. I mean, a, a remarkably high proportion of all the deaths in the conflict happened in North Belfast within walking distance from each other, particular neighbourhoods. But overall, it, it had a huge impact. Another, another point I guess I made in, in that introduction was that the participation rate for the IRA was remarkably high. Martin McGuinness, who was one of the most senior IRA commanders who would have been in a position to know, he estimated that in and around 10,000 people had been members of the IRA at one point during the conflict. Now, they weren't all members at the same time, of course. Some people would have been members for a few months. Some people would have been members for several decades. But as many as 10,000 people took part in this clandestine, illegal armed organisation that was waging war on the British state. Now, out of a, a population of 1 million, 10,000 people is, is quite a high proportion in itself. But when you look at it from the point of view that the IRA was recruiting from a much narrower pool out of that 1 million people because it didn't recruit at all from the Protestant Unionist community for obvious reasons. It tended not to recruit from the Catholic middle class. Um, there were exceptions to that role, but by and large, people who joined the IRA tended to come from working class backgrounds in the nationalist community. And they also tended to be young. There were very few people above the age of 30 who would have joined the IRA once they had work and family commitments. So it, it tended to be people in their late teens and their early 20s. It also tended to be men rather than women. Again, there were exceptions to that. There were female members of the IRA, but the typical IRA recruit was a young male working class Catholic. So it was really a remarkably high proportion of people from that background who became involved at some point or another. And there were tens of thousands of years of prison sentences served from that particular demographic. And it had a huge impact on, on the communities from which those people came. Uh, again, there were very few people who wouldn't have had uh, a relative or a neighbour who was serving time in prison. It's interesting you say that because I was back in Dublin before Christmas and I was in the shop and I, found, I saw your book and I bought it and I was I was reading it when I came back to London and the sales were on and I was out shopping with my missus and my kid and we were in a shop. We're in there for a good while. And I kind of forgot that I was reading like a book about the IRA walking around the streets of London. Not the brightest thing in the world to be doing. And I was in the we're in this shop and anyway, my missus was trying on these clothes for quite a while. And uh, we went to the till and she wanted to buy like five or six things. And we went to the till and I was paying for them. The guy behind the till was this young guy. And he was like a young English guy. And he said, I saw the book you were reading. And I, was, I said to myself, oh, shit. I said, uh, oh, yeah. I said, oh, I, for I forgot I was walking around, you know, reading a book about the IRA. It's, I probably want to watch myself doing that. And he said, uh, he said, oh, no, you're all right. He said, my grandfather, it was in the IRA. And uh, it turns out his, his granddad was like from Belfast in the 70s. <laughs> so anyway, we, we walked out and I bought the stuff and I, I was... We went in for a bite to eat and I got out the receipt and we're just looking at the receipt and seeing how much we paid for all this stuff. And the guy had swiped. He, he put them all through the scanner, but he had only actually charged us for like half of them. So he <laughs> saved us like about 150 quid on clothes. <laughs> so I was like, I made a profit on your book, Dan. That's all I'm going to say. I made a profit. <laughs> I was quite surprised. Like when reading when you say that about how many young Belfast Catholic men went through that working class men. You know, just like that one interaction I had really brings it home. I guess there's a real discrepancy there between the experience of people in Northern Ireland and the experience of people in Britain, where the extent to which people in Britain were affected was much more limited because you would have had people serving in the British Army, of course, but they were a minority of the population, them, them and their relatives, and then also the people who were affected by IRA bombings. In, in cities like London or Manchester. But again, it's a much more limited cross-section of the population than people in the north of Ireland. There's an intimacy of the conflict there in, in the north that didn't really exist in Britain or, or even 
didn't exist to the same extent in, in the South with people being affected. You know, the, the difference between growing up in Dublin during the 1970s and 80s and, and growing up in Belfast, which was just two hours away by, by road or by rail, was enormous. Can you give us a, a quick rundown? It's a hard question, I know, on, on like, you know, the origins of partition. So, so for people who don't know about partition and what were the base causes of it? Yeah, I mean, if you trace it back a long time, it, it goes back several centuries when um, Ulster became the province in the northeast of Ireland, became the heartland of Protestant settlement. And coming into the late 19th century, it was the only place in Ireland where unionism, the philosophy that wanted to have union between Ireland and Britain, uh, it was the only place where it had a mass popular base. And that was very important because in the late 19th century, in the British political system, which included the whole of Ireland at that point, you were entering into the age of mass politics. The franchise was being extended and it was no longer possible to have a strictly elite political base for your party. Both the Liberals and the Conservatives were beginning to reach out to wider layers of people. So once the franchise was extended for Ireland in the 1870s and the 1880s, the only base for the Unionist Party uh, where it could still win seats comfortably and, and compete with the nationalist parties was in Ulster. So you saw that uh, deviation between Ulster and the rest of the island already in the 1880s. Now, it didn't come to a head because the Home Rule Party, which was so-called because it wanted to have a Home Rule Parliament within the United Kingdom, Ireland would still be part of the United Kingdom and part of the British Empire, but it would have its own self-governing assembly in Dublin, a little like the assemblies that you now have in, in Scotland and in Wales. And for many Irish nationalists, that was seen as, as a stepping stone to full independence. They didn't think they could achieve full independence, but a Home Rule Parliament was a step towards that. So that proposal was initially voted down in the House of Commons and the House of Lords at Westminster in London. So it wasn't necessary for the Ulster Unionists to take matters into their own hands. But several decades later, you had a new alignment of forces at Westminster with an alliance between the Liberal Party and the Home Rule Party from Ireland. And this time the House of Lords had been stripped of its power of veto. So it looked as if a bill to establish a Home Rule Parliament was going to pass the two houses at Westminster. And the Ulster Unionists began organising for armed resistance to that in 1912 and 1913. And what was significant was that they received adamant support, militant support from the Conservative Party which was led by a man called Andrew Bonner Law at that time, who had family background in Ulster. And he famously said that there were no lengths to which Ulster could go, by which he meant Protestant Unionist Ulster, that he would not support them in, um, including armed resistance, um, violent resistance to the legal authorities of the British state. He, there were also many sympathisers in, in the British army uh, in the officer corps of the British Army for the Unionist cause. So it became clear to the Liberal government that they wouldn't be able to use the British Army uh, as a reliable weapon to enforce law and order in Ireland. And matters were coming to a head in 1913, 1914. It looked as if there might be civil war in Ireland. Then the First World War broke out. That diverted people's energies for a time. But in 1916, there was an attempted nationalist uprising in Dublin and in some other parts of the country, which was defeated, but which led to the radicalisation of Irish nationalism and the majority of the, the Irish nationalist population. It led to the victory of Sinn Féin in the 1918 general election when they swept the boards outside of Ulster. They won pretty much all the seats that were going in the country. And they set up an independent Irish parliament, which at that time was a rebel parliament. It was outside the laws of the British state. And soon after, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, began an uprising, a guerrilla warfare campaign against British rule. So by 1921, they had brought the British government, represented by Lloyd George and Winston Churchill from the Liberal Party, they had brought them to the negotiating table. And an agreement was concluded to set up um, what was called the Free State, the Irish Free State, um, which had the same status as the governments of Canada or Australia or New Zealand, de facto independence, although still part of the British Empire, the British Commonwealth. But that, that arrangement for the rest of Ireland excluded most of Ulster. It did not include six counties of Ulster that became Northern Ireland, which was still part of the British state. 
Now, what made that so controversial for nationalists? Nationalists rejected any kind of partition. They wanted the whole of Ireland to be part of an independent state. But in particular, this version of partition was considered by them to be deeply unjust because it included out of the six counties that were assigned to this new polity of Northern Ireland, two of the six had a nationalist majority and it included areas along the, the border, uh, cities like Derry and Newry and Straban uh, that had a, a strong nationalist majority, an overwhelming nationalist majority in the case of Derry. So they considered Northern Ireland to be an illegitimate political entity and, and for a long time nationalist parties in the north refused to cooperate with the institutions of the Northern Irish state. And what it also meant from the perspective of the Unionist Party was that they had to impose a very coercive political regime on the nationalist minority. So for cities like Derry, there was crude gerrymandering imposed to prevent the, the nationalist majority of the population from electing a majority of nationalist politicians and parties well into the 1960s, uh, despite the fact that Derry had, had an overwhelming uh, nationalist majority, it still elected a unionist council because of the, the gerrymandering. And the same practices were applied in counties like Tyrone and Fermanagh. Um, in the rest of Northern Ireland, it wasn't necessary to have such crude gerrymandering because there was a unionist majority, but there were other coercive policies imposed on, on the nationalist minority. There was a special powers act which gave the unionist government in Northern Ireland extraordinary powers. They could intern suspects without trial, they could ban political organisations, they could ban newspapers on any charge that they saw fit. Famously, one of the leading politicians in South Africa, one of the architects of the apartheid regime there, um, he said that he would trade all the repressive legislation that might be passed by the South African Parliament for just one clause of the Northern Ireland Special Powers Act, because it was, you know, a perfect tool for any kind of authoritarian regime. And there was resistance to the status quo in Northern Ireland, including attempts at armed resistance by what remained of the Irish Republican Army, because the IRA that had fought the War of Independence uh, between 1919 and, and 1921 had gone through a number of splits. Most of its former members had been reconciled to the Irish state in the south and were no longer in, interested in getting involved in any kind of armed campaign against British rule in the north. But there was a, a minority rump of the IRA that tried to start uh, campaigns of guerrilla warfare uh, against British rule in the north in the 1940s and the 1950s um, and had no impact whatsoever because they yeah, had so no real support from the nationalist population. So tell us about these. Had one particularly large operation called Operation Harvest. Can you tell us what happened with that? Yeah, it was it was the precursor to the much more significant war in the nineteen seventies and the nineteen eighties. But at the time, it seemed like it would be the swan song of the IRA and of the whole revolutionary nationalist tradition because the IRA um, started this campaign in nineteen fifty six. It had high hopes. It thought that it was in its strongest position since the nineteen twenties. And there was some emotional support for the campaign at the very beginning. The IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin, won a number of seats in the South, in the Southern Parliament, the Doyle. But within a short space of time, the campaign was was clamped down upon and, and really rolled back by the authorities on both sides of the border because both the Unionist government in the North and the Nationalist Fianna Fáil government in the South imposed internment of suspects without trial and they swept up a large proportion of the IRA membership on both sides of the border. And the number of attacks declined sharply. So by the time the IRA formally called off the campaign in, in 1962, for all practical purposes, it had ended a long time before that. And the statement that they issued announcing the end of the campaign complained that the Irish people were indifferent to their cause and they blamed the authorities, particularly in the South, for distracting people from the cause of Irish unity. But really, it was their own responsibility that they had failed to uh, mobilise any kind of wide popular support, either in the South or more significantly among, among the people in the North, on whose behalf they had claimed to be fighting. You know, they said that they were fighting to liberate the nationalist minority, but the nationalist minority looked upon their campaign with, with indifference, even if they had private sympathy for it, they certainly didn't get, get involved in any significant way. So after the failure of that campaign, the IRA 
was reduced to a rump of a few hundred people in the early to mid 1960s. The new leader of the IRA, the new chief of staff, is a man called Cahill Gilding, and he decided to lead the IRA on a new experimental path where instead of just putting forward a nationalist agenda, concentrating on the goal of Irish unity to the exclusion of, of all other issues, Gilding and his allies tried to redefine the Republican movement as a left-wing movement, a socialist movement that was also fighting against, against capitalism uh, and against the ruling economic class in the South. And so there were various attempts to do that by organising housing campaigns, by organising campaigns over land rights, uh, by intervening in, in the trade union movement and trying to support worker struggles. And they redefined the goal of the IRA and Sinn Féin as being to establish a, a socialist workers 32 county republic. Now, that had limited impact up until the late 1960s. There was a modest increase in the membership of the IRA. They were involved in various social struggles in the South. And the authorities in the South, the, the police special branch, kept a watchful eye on them. But they were more of an irritant than an actual revolutionary threat to the status quo. And they probably would have remained an irritant rather than a revolutionary challenge if it wasn't for events in the North, because the Republican movement decided to become involved with others in a civil rights campaign, which was set up in 1967, uh, called the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. And it was an attempt to really to come up with a new line of approach, a new way of challenging the status quo in the North, because the idea of a direct frontal challenge was seen to have failed, whether it was the IRA taking up arms against the state or it was the Nationalist Party running candidates for election and refusing to participate in the Northern Irish Parliament. It had had no, no impact. The status quo seemed to be safe and sound. So the civil rights campaign was directly inspired by the example of the civil rights movement in the United States by figures like Martin Luther King, not always based on a, a detailed study of um, the experience and the tactics of the US civil rights movement, but very often inspired by what people were seeing on their television screens. Sorry, what do you mean by they weren't informed so much? Well, I mean, I mean, in, for some of the people who got involved in, in that campaign, they had read in detail about the experience of the US civil rights movement, but others had more of a, a vague impression of what that movement involved uh, from having seen footage of you know the demonstrations in Birmingham or in Selma, Mississippi, South Carolina on, on their television screens because the you know, civil rights campaign was being covered by British and Irish television stations. So they had this idea that you would set up a campaign that was fighting for equality within Northern Ireland rather than demanding the end of the state and demanding uh, that British rule be ended. And people were saying that they wanted to have equal rights as citizens of, of this state. And in many cases, that would have meant bringing the law in Northern Ireland into line with the law in the rest of Britain. Uh, in the rest of the United Kingdom, because, for example, uh, one of the ways in which nationalists felt that they were discriminated against was local elections in the North did not have universal suffrage. There was a property qualification. You had to be um, a homeowner or a business owner in order to vote. So people who lived in public housing, in, in council houses and flats, uh, weren't able to vote, and that disproportionately affected Catholics, it also affected working class Protestants, but, but it particularly disenfranchised Catholics. And that was the reason why it was kept in place. Now, that was no longer the case in, in Britain. Uh, Britain had universal suffrage for local elections. So in many ways, the programme of the civil rights campaign was demanding that Northern Ireland be brought into line with the rest of the United Kingdom. It wasn't demanding a united Ireland. It wasn't demanding socialism or anything like that. And it did attract a wide cross-section of people. Uh, Republicans were involved in the campaign from the start, but there were also people from much more moderate nationalist parties, there were liberals, uh, people from the trade union movement and from the communist party. It, it was quite a broad and, and diverse campaign. And its first real day of action came in October 1968, when there was a demonstration in Derry. As I mentioned earlier, Derry was the second largest city in the north. It had an overwhelming nationalist majority, but had a unionist council because of gerrymandering. Uh, there were all kinds of discrimination against the majority population there, including the fact that demonstrations that were associated with the nationalist community were typically banned from the city centre. The city centre was considered to be an exclusively unionist domain. 
So this civil rights march announced its intention to, to march through the city centre. It was banned by the unionist government. And when the march went ahead, the marchers were attacked by police officers from, from the RUC, the, the Royal Ulster Constabulary. There was a television crew there. So this was by no means the first time a, a demonstration had been attacked by the police, but it was the first time that it was it was filmed and the footage was shown in Britain and it was shown around the world. So the unionist government came under intense pressure to carry out reforms. And there was a year from from that demonstration leading up to the late summer of 1969, when on the one hand, the unionist government was dragging its feet over reform and offering very limited concessions that weren't enough to satisfy the civil rights movement and weren't enough to satisfy the nationalist community. But even those very limited concessions were seen as unacceptable by unionist hardliners. They were denounced as, as a sellout to Irish nationalism. And you had people like Ian Paisley, for example, who was a hardline Protestant fundamentalist cleric accusing the unionist government of treason uh, and accusing them of selling out to Irish nationalists and to the IRA. There was a lot of scaremongering about the IRA at the time. In fact, the IRA was, was largely inactive in a military sense. Some of its members were involved in, in political activism through the civil rights campaign, but they weren't actually involved in, in carrying out attacks or planning attacks. There were unionist paramilitary groups, one group called the Ulster Volunteer Force that were active at the time. And they actually carried out a number of bombings in, in 1969 that were blamed on the IRA at the time, but they were actually carried out by opponents of the IRA to, to discredit the government. And it all came to a head in August 1969 when there was an attempt by the police to force a, a unionist demonstration through Derry. And people in Derry were thoroughly fed up by that time. There had been a number of demonstrations attacked by the police. Uh, a man had actually died after... He was assaulted by police officers in his in his own home. So there was a real mood of anger in the nationalist community in Derry. And when the RUC tried to force through this march, they were met with a hail of stones and bottles and petrol bombs. And you had uh, an insurgency that lasted for several days that was known as the Battle of the Bogside. The Bogside was the, the main nationalist population centre in Derry. And the disturbances in Derry quickly spread to the rest of Northern Ireland and particularly to Belfast. But the dynamic was very different in, in Belfast because nationalists were a minority of the population. Sectarian rioting bro broke out and um, the RUC sent in armoured cars with heavy machine guns and started firing in, in densely populated areas. And by the time the trouble died down, se several people were dead. The majority of the people who were dead were, were nationalists and hundreds of families have been driven out of their homes and again, the majority of those people were, were nationalists from Belfast in particular. So the, the choice was made by the British government then to send in the troops, to send in the British army to enforce the law and order as they would have defined it. But the most significant result of what happened in August 1969 in the long run was that it was followed by a split in the IRA because there was an old guard in the IRA who hadn't been particularly happy on the political turn that Cahill Goulding had brought the movement in during the 1960s. They saw it as a deviation from what the IRA should be about. They thought the IRA should really just be about armed struggle, about organising guerrilla warfare to British rule. And so they broke away in the autumn of 1969 and they set up what, what became known as the Provisional IRA, which was very much a, a, a kind of back to basics movement. You know, let, let's get away from this kind of political campaigning. Let's get away from this talk about socialism and class struggle, let's get back to what we know best, which is organising people to take up arms against British rule. So is this Sean McStephan? Was he involved yeah, the, in that split? Yeah, the, the, the leading figure on the side of the provisional IRA, on that side of the split, the leading figures were, were Sean McStephan, uh, who became the new chief of staff of the provisional IRA, and Rory O'Brady, another figure in, in the south. Um, McStephan and, and uh, O'Brady were both based in the south of Ireland. But there was also a group of IRA veterans from Belfast and, and Derry who became involved, uh, people like Joe Cattle, uh, Seamus Toomey, Billy McKee. And they were the ones who took who took the reins to begin with. But what became much more important in the long run was, was a much younger generation of Republican activists who became involved in the IRA. These were people who, in some cases, they had been activists in the civil rights movement. In other cases, they hadn't been politically active as such. They had come out on these demonstrations, 
or in 1969 and 1970, when, when the British Army came to Northern Ireland, they became involved in, in riots, throwing stones at British soldiers. And there was a sort of uneasy intermediate period where the IRA hadn't felt it was ready to take up arms and start attacking British soldiers, but there was constant low-level violence in cities like Derry and Belfast with local teenagers engaging in, in confrontations with the British Army and throwing stones and throwing other projectiles at, at British soldiers. But over the course of about a year and a half, the Provisional IRA recruited enough people, predominantly people in their late teens and their early 20s, that it felt able to start carrying out attacks on British soldiers in order to, as, as they would have seen it, to force out the British state and to achieve a united Ireland. And some of the people who became involved at that time went on to be very influential figures. Jerry Adams, who to this day is, is the most important figure in the Republican movement, he became a, a young IRA commander in Belfast. Martin McGuinness, who, who was his closest ally in the Sinn Féin leadership until his death um, a number of years ago, he became involved as one of those teenagers in Derry who were going out to confront the British Army. He joined the IRA and, and within a couple of years he had become the most significant IRA commander in Derry when he was still only 20 or 21. How did the Provost strategy then evolve? I suppose you could say it was primarily a military strategy at this stage. Yeah, I mean, when they when they started out, what they brought to the table in terms of political ideology was a mentality. I would say it was more of a mentality than, than a, a formal programme that had taken root since the 1920s, where the people who had remained loyal to the IRA, to that tradition of militant revolutionary Irish nationalism, had come to distrust politics. Uh, for them, politics was a dirty word, and their understanding of politics was pretty broad. You know, it, it, it wasn't just taking part in parliamentary politics. It was really any kind of political activity that wasn't armed struggle, that wasn't taking up arms against the state. So getting involved in trade unions or community campaigns, they were distrustful of that. And it was based on their interpretation of what had happened during the War of Independence that, as far as they were concerned back then, the IRA, the old IRA, had fought the British Army uh, and the British Empire to a standstill. And then the leadership of Sinn Féin, people like Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins, went off to London to negotiate uh, with the British government. And according to the IRA hardliners, they had sold out. They had signed this sellout peace agreement uh, with the British state. And the lesson they drew from that was you can't trust the politicians. Uh, you can't trust people who, who are involved in political activity because they'll always sell you out. And so what they wanted was an IRA that would concentrate in a very narrow way on military activity, on guerrilla warfare. Now, that was a, a very misleading interpretation, really, of what had happened between 1918 and 1921, that the, the fact that the British army was brought to the negotiation table, uh, the British state was brought to the negotiation table, I should say, it wasn't simply through the, the IRA campaign, the campaign of guerrilla warfare. It was also through the, the political mobilisation of Sinn Féin, the fact that they had won national elections, to give their cause legitimacy. It was also through various forms of civil resistance, for example, with the trade union movement calling a, a general strike, stopping the movement of British troops on, on the railways and so on. But that wasn't the lesson that uh, the people who set up the provisional IRA had drawn from, from that experience. So when they started their campaign in 1970, 1971, they had a very simple understanding that all that they needed to do was to start carrying out attacks on the British army, and recruit people through that campaign of, of shootings and bombings and, and destabilise the status quo and make the British position in Northern Ireland untenable. And they had in mind as well the example of some of the anti-colonial insurgencies that had been going on in other parts of the British Empire in the 1950s and the 1960s in places like Cyprus, Kenya, Aden in, in what is now modern day Yemen. So for example, the IRA leadership in, in the early 70s, they were keeping tabs on how many British soldiers they had killed because they thought once they reached the, the point where they had killed more British soldiers than had died in Aden in the campaign there, that would be the tipping point. That would be the point where the British government decided to cut its losses and leave. It sounds like Robert McNamara. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is a kind of um, a very militarist mentality that you famously get in conventional armies, but also in um, guerrilla armies, you know, you do get some of the same attitudes of, you know, that if, if we just get the politicians out of the way and, and we, we fight a simple campaign without one, one hand tied behind our back as they would have seen it, then we can achieve our goals. And if we don't achieve our goals in the short run, then we just escalate, you know. 
so the you know the IRA in in the early 70s they stumbled across a weapon which became hugely important for them and hugely important around the world which was the car bomb Mike Davis wrote a very interesting book about the history of the car bomb and he identified Northern Ireland in in the 1970s as the, the first time when a guerrilla army had had discovered the potential of, of the car bomb as a weapon it was known as, as the poor man's air force because you could inflict the same kind of devastation on on a, an urban center that aerial bombar- bombardment would inflict simply by having access to cars usually stolen and and whatever explosives you could stuff in the boot you know on the, on the one hand their campaign was very successful in destabilizing the status quo in northern ireland and it reached a point in in the spring of 1972 where the British government imposed direct rule. There had been a devolved parliament, a devolved administration in Belfast, run by the Unionist Party for over half a century, and the um, British government decided that it was no longer possible to leave political affairs in in the hands of the Unionist Party, so they imposed direct rule from London. And the IRA at that time thought that they had won, you know, they thought that they had their enemy on the ropes, and they called a ceasefire and sat down for direct negotiations with the British government, William Whitelaw, a conservative politician, the British government sat directly across the table from Sean McStephon and Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and the other members of the IRA leadership. So understandably, in a way, the provisionals thought that they had won. This was the sign of how seriously they were being taken by the British government, that they were being invited for direct negotiations. Now, that was actually a very unrealistic assessment of, of what the British government wanted at that time. They weren't prepared to pull out. They weren't thinking of pulling out at all. They would have been willing to make more limited concessions to the Republican movement, but they weren't willing to contemplate ending British sovereignty in Northern Ireland altogether. Um, so the provisionals came out of those negotiations without having achieved their maximum goals, what they said they were fighting for. And because they didn't have any political organisation at that time, they just had the IRA. That was the the only weapon that they had. They had no alternative really but to go back to war because if they hadn't gone back to war, they would have become irrelevant. They would have been marginalised by other political movements that, that did have the capacity to intervene in that field. And so the IRA went, went back to war. But very soon they found themselves on the back foot. They found themselves marginalised in a way that hadn't been the case in the early months of 1972. And the whole subsequent history of the Republican movement for the next 20 years, in a way, was an attempt to recapture that dynamism, that sense of momentum that they had enjoyed in, in the early months of 1972, which they never fully managed, managed to do. They had a very large bombing campaign on one day in Belfast. What, what year was that when they exploded like 25, 30 bombs within an hour of each other? Yeah, that was in, in the summer of 1972. That was known as, as Bloody Friday. Yeah, that was that was an incident that really, in a way, captured the the problems of of Republican militarism and, and their lack of political understanding and, and political nuance. That it was after the period I've been talking about, where the the truce and the negotiations with the British government had broken down, and the IRA went back to war, and it was a time when the nationalist population had a very you know ambivalent feeling about the way ahead they had welcomed the fall of the unionist government in northern ireland they saw that as a victory the british government had spoken about carrying out reforms that would address some of the grievances of the nationalist community so you know there was a feeling among many nationalists that it wasn't the the time to go back to war that it was it was better to wait and see what was on offer from from the british side but it was at exactly that moment that the ira decided to launch a full-scale resumption of its campaign and a major escalation of its campaign of car bombing. And on one day, they planted dozens of bombs around the city centre of Belfast. They phoned in warnings to the authorities, but there were too many bombs for them to cope with. The, the time that they gave with the, with the warnings wasn't adequate. And so seven people were killed and, and dozens of people were, were injured, including some people who were very seriously injured. And it was a, a disaster for the provisionals, for the IRA. It was a propaganda disaster. And it, it really alienated a lot of their potential supporters from them. And it was after that that the British Army launched a major operation that was known as Operation Motorman. Large areas of Derry and Belfast had been no-go areas for the British Army. That was what they were known as, no-go areas, no-go zones, because it wasn't safe for British soldiers to go in there. And the IRA thought it was responsible for that, you know. It was because um, British soldiers were afraid of being shot fired upon by the IRA that they didn't go in there 
But that wasn't really the main the main reason. The main reason was that they faced almost unanimous hostility from the nationalist community in those neighbourhoods. And that was shown because after Bloody Friday, there wasn't the same mood of unified opposition and hostility and resistance to the British military. And the British army was able to sweep in there very easily and, and establish bases and set up obs- observation posts and observation terrors and so on. Um, so the IRA was, was much more on the, on the back foot. So this this kind of generally left the IRA kind of floundering with just a purely military strategy. What, what was the catalyst for them going towards a kind of a political strategy, or or even a social strategy? There was elements of social strategy too, wasn't there? Yeah. Well, what you got in the in the late nineteen seventies was the emergence of a new leadership group in the Republican movement, grouped around Jerry Adams, who quickly became the most significant figure in the movement, and they took over the reins. After the breakdown of, there was a second truce between the IRA and the, and the British government in 1975, which lasted for the best part of a year. The IRA leadership sat down for lengthy negotiations with, with the, the British side. They were hoping at that point that the British government was willing to pull out of Northern Ireland. Um, not so much because they would have been fought to, the, to a standstill by the IRA, but more a sense that um, perhaps the British were, were simply fed up with Northern Ireland because the previous year, in 1974, they had tried a new political initiative to set up a, a power-sharing government between nationalist and unionist parties, which was known as the Sunningdale Agreement. And that was brought down not by the IRA. The IRA opposed it, naturally enough, because it fell short of their demand for a united Ireland, but it was brought down by resistance from hardline unionists. So the Republican leadership were hoping that after that experience, after the people who were supposedly loyal to Britain had thwarted British policy, that the government of Harold Wilson, the, the Labour Prime Minister in London, they might simply be fed up and decide that they would pull the plug for want of a better option. It became clear over the course of the year that the British side really were not contemplating withdrawal in that sense. Uh, and in fact, the IRA leadership increasingly came to believe that they were being strung along, that it was actually the goal of the British government to get them on the hook by giving them the impression they were willing to pull out in Northern Ireland. And then after they had been on ceasefire for a long period of time, they would find it simply impossible to go back to war, even though they hadn't achieved their goal of a united Ireland. So they did go back to war at the beginning of 1976 and very soon found that they were in in a difficult position. They were close to defeat because the number one factor was the lack of popular support in, in nationalist communities. Uh, there was a real sense of war fatigue at that point because the, the the conflicts had been going on for several years. It was much longer than the War of Independence back in the 1920s. And people might have been willing to put up with that if they had a sense that it was going places, you know, that it was going to achieve something. But there was a real sense that this was a, a futile campaign by the IRA. And there were big protests which developed largely spontaneously in, in 1976 uh, the so-called peace people, which were demanding an end to, to paramilitary violence in the north. So that was the context in which Jerry Adams and his allies took over the, the movement. They accused the old leadership of, of having been very naive and having been duped by the British into calling their ceasefire. But they also set out their own vision for the way ahead. And there were two strands to this, really. There was a military strand and a political strand. Uh, and on the military side, what Adams and his allies did was to reorganise the IRA as a much smaller organisation than it had been in in the early 1970s, so that it was much harder to beat because at any given time there would be a a small number of IRA members involved in in carrying out attacks and and even if they were arrested or fired upon by the British Army, the majority of of the organisation would still be intact. So so they they preserved the IRA as a, a kind of weapon used to keep pressure on the British government and to destabilise politics in Northern Ireland. But at the same time, they rolled out the idea of a political turn. They talked about building up a political movement. Now, in many ways, this was going back to the ideas of of Cahill Goulding in the mid-1960s, and the idea that you should get involved in class struggles. um, And particularly in the South, they talked about intervening in the trade union movement in the South and, and having a sort of convergence between the IRA armed struggle in the north and a revolutionary class struggle in the south. Now, that never really happened and it it might have remained uh, a dead letter if if not for a very different issue, which was the question of political status for IRA prisoners in the jails in the north. 
On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order, The Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, and Swampside Chats. <laughs>